Hi, everybody. Uh, so I won't take full credit for that. Of course, I have a, have a team uh, also with Noemi uh, Grichko and uh, Hanya Novitska, uh, who also contributed as well. Um, so anyways, I'll just give you all a brief introduction to the platform, uh, just if anybody missed it before. Um, so some things to be mindful of. I did just mention the chat. So you'll see event and stage. That's where you're chatting. So again, if you want to talk to everybody in the entire event, you have events, then you have stage. Uh, but on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see reception, which is where more or less you join, you see what activity is going on for the day. You have the stage, which is where we are now. Uh, there is a 30 second delay, so you'll notice a little bit uh, of a delay when you're asking questions. Uh, sessions is where all of our sessions will be housed for the day, so that's where we'll have three to four uh, parallel streams at once. Uh, and then networking. Networking is really important. You'll have up to five minutes to network with someone at random. Uh, and we're really, really, really encouraging. That's one of the main elements of our event. So we really want to encourage you to network. And then also Expo. Expo is a place where we asked you all to send us some information so we can highlight the work that others are doing in the space. Uh, so anyways, uh, I want to also mention that on our website, so gamechangereu.org slash camp, uh, we will have our resources. So following the event, we'll be cleaning up all these videos that we're doing for our sessions, have those housed there. We'll also have our state-of-the-art analysis. We'll have our social media training tools, which is a which is a full PowerPoint slide deck, uh, as well as a handbook, everything else that goes with that, a trainer's manual. We'll also have an eva a campaign evaluation manual and then a communication campaign campaign communication manual as well. Um, and then as far as our event goes, day one will be focused primarily on radicalization, so preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, day two will focus on gamification uh, as gamification as an educational tool, gamification as a way as a means to prevent and counter violent extremism. Uh, and then day three, we'll focus on uh, evaluation of both online and offline campaigns. Uh, and we will also focus on combining online and offline activities. Uh, and then day four, we'll actually have an opportunity to play our game. So we'll have a total of 48 people playing our game. Uh, but just because you missed, uh, just if, if you missed this, because we don't have enough game masters to, to get everybody, uh, then we'll definitely make space at a later date. So we, we will definitely be in touch. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to go hope, go ahead and pass this over to TechSoup's Vice President, uh, so the Vice President of TechSoup Europe, uh, Anna Shanitska. Uh, so I'd like to welcome her to the main stage, so she'll be joining us in a moment. So uh, anyways, I'm going to say bye to Francesco for the moment and pass it over to Anna Shanitska. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm here to welcome you and thank you for joining the event. Um, I can't see you, unfortunately. I'm hoping you are there and you're doing well and you are smiling to me, uh, despite the corona situation, which makes our meeting offline impossible. But nevertheless, I think we'll do our best, uh, basically, to, to make this event uh, interesting. Um, I'm here really to tell you a little bit more why we are doing it. Why is it so important for TechSoup uh, to organize similar events? to support organizations and activists working uh, in the area of youth. Mm, it is important because you actually shape our future, uh, because whatever you do is going to have a huge influence on, on this planet. If it's equalizing uh, ch uh, chances, is it uh, for job or education uh, for youth, or engaging youth in democracy and government, or fighting climate change. In any case, youth and tech is something that we believe has a huge impact on your work. Why? Because youth use technology every day uh, in all areas of their life. And then brings a lot of opportunities, but that also brings a lot of risks. We're going to talk about both. Uh, and why is it so important? Because technology can have a huge impact on everyday life of youth. Because internet is not neutral, because big data, they cause inequalities, because Social media can be used by the radical extremist groups, uh, basically to, to influence uh, everyday youth behaviors. And today we're going to talk about all of it. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to get skills, tools and connections that we're going to inspire you. And thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the uh, day and the rest of upcoming events. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to our keynote speaker for the day, and that'll be Dr. Erin Saltman uh, with Facebook, who, with whom I will let uh, introduce herself further. So I will pass it over to Erin and welcome her to the main stage. <laughs> Thanks. From one Erin to another, although spelled slightly differently, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm based in London. Um, and I think Erin let me introduce myself, particularly because our jobs at Facebook, this sort of team in a tech company, is not necessarily something that people widely know about or 
five or 10 years ago didn't even exist. So my name's Erin and I'm on the counterterrorism and dangerous organizations policy team at Facebook. Uh, and I come from a complete background of looking at processes of radicalization, particularly things like online radicalization, youth political socialization, gender and violent extremism. Um, and I can tell you when I was doing my original studies, there was no way I thought I would end up in a private tech company. And it's a good thing that we're starting to build out these teams internal to social media, because I don't think anyone on this call would think that social media does not have a role to play in preventing and countering violent extremism at this point. Uh, but today it's worth discussing why that can't be a solo effort. That can't just be an effort done just by civil society or just by tech companies or just by government. Uh, why this has to be a, a multi-sector approach, but also what does that mean the role of civil society is? So with that, I wanna talk a little bit about what do we even mean when we talk about preventing and countering hate-based extremism? We're not talking about any type of extremism, we're talking about hate-based extremism and violent extremism. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we think the role of tech companies should be and can be, but also why that is gonna be limited without partnerships with civil society groups and just on the ground activists. So I'm assuming that is all of you dialed into this call now. And I wanna be really practical about why certain approaches to online activism when you're pushing back on hate-based extremism are going to maybe work better than others and some of those top tips. I know I have a workshop later in the day to really dive into that with a group of you, but for now let's, let's go to this overview and hopefully it inspires you in how you're approaching uh, your online activism and what that might start to look like. So firstly, what's the role of tech? First and foremost, it's always going to be the case that we need to have terms of service and community guidelines that explicitly say what's not allowed and make policies that disallow hate-based extremism and violence uh, on the platform, trying to make sure that we're not a catalyst for that so that we're not the area where that is sparking radicalization. Now that is easier said than done. Um, if you do want, you can go on the Facebook community standards and we actually have an open definition of what we mean when we say terrorism or hate-based organizations. And it really has to look at behaviors. Are we looking at premeditated violence? Are we looking at groups that are organizing around symbols, slogans, and banners that have a hate-based mission that are attacking people based on things like the UN protected categories of people based on race, religion, gender, sexuality. And so when we say violent extremism, that's going to mean very different things depending on what part of society you come from and depending on where you're based. Uh, violent extremism today could be anything from white supremacy and neo-Nazi networks to Islamist extremist networks to Buddhist extremist networks. We see groups that are targeting different aspects of xenophobia. Uh, we see the LGBTQIA plus community under threat. And so depending on who you are and who your background is, you might be trying to tackle one side of hate-based extremism. And so for us, step one is making sure we have policies that we can then act on to remove violating content. What does that look like? Well, first that looks like making sure we have a bunch of people in house that actually have expertise on the subject. As I mentioned, most of the people on my team did not expect to be working for Facebook if you asked them five years ago where they thought their job careers were going. And we have grown out teams to now have over 350 people just on the dangerous organizations teams. Um, and that's supplemented by about 35,000 people on safety and operations teams. That means language support. That means operating on five different global time zones. That means having to have nuanced language support for different types of language that you might not think are needed. But in fact, if I go to Nigeria and I say we cover 100 languages, they might laugh because in Nigeria alone, there are 200 languages on the ground in different dialects. So we're having to constantly localize our understanding of how hate manifests. And that also includes partnerships with civil society groups and NGOs. Uh, there's nothing worse than realizing there's a gap in how you've been looking at how hate manifests. Um, we supplement that with technology. So the, the interesting side is as a social scientist by trade, getting to work with engineers and data scientists on seeing what we can do to proactively detect and remove 
violent extremist and terrorist content and hate speech. So that includes things like photo and video matching. So if we know that a piece of propaganda has come about, we wanna make sure we can hash that, which is like turning an image or a video into a digital fingerprint and then allowing it to catch any further shares of that and go back in time and seeing how else that might've been shared if it's explicitly violating but also building an understanding. So tech is not ever a full solution. You might have something that is explicitly a horrible piece of violent extremist propaganda, and perhaps a really positive civil society group has reappropriated that content and used it as counter speech within a counter narrative. So we have to train machines as well to, if there is context to look at, triage that content to human review teams. It's getting increasingly uh, human and tech in combination. It is very rarely just one or just the other. We also look at things like recidivism to make sure the same bad actors don't repeat coming back on the platform. There's lots of adversarial shifts there, um, but also things like strategic network disruption. So if you understand processes of radicalization, you understand it really doesn't happen in an individualized silo. There's always this allure about thinking through the lone wolf phenomena and that is a very rare case study. In fact, arguably almost never. There is always some form of social network around that individual online and or offline. And that is a social process. So radicalization in and of itself is a social process. And so we can use these social processes to think through how to combat radicalization. What can we replace it with? How do we counter it? How do we provide alternatives to it? So on the one side, get the bad content down when it violates a policy. What does that result in? Uh, well, just in the last quarter, so just in the last three months alone, Facebook removed over 4 million pieces of content for being associated with hate-based organizations and over 8.7 million pieces of content for being associated with violent extremist terrorist groups. That's a huge amount of content. And so it sounds very impressive to say that we're removing all this content, but if you are in this space of challenging hate and extremism, you know that one, that's, that's not the fullest picture. There's a lot of gray area content where maybe it doesn't quite violate a, a policy, but that it is disturbing and it is perhaps a whistleblower tactic to mobilize around a hate-based ideology. We also know that censorship alone does not actually counter extremism. Censorship and removal of content is needed, but it really tackles a symptom, not a cause. And that's where we need a better conversation about strategic, what we're calling counter speech or counter narratives or alternative narratives. So what does that then look like? Well, radicalization, as I mentioned, is a social process. And we often tend to assume that when somebody joins a violent extremist group that First of all, there must be something wrong with them. So first we like to think that perhaps mentally they were disturbed or unstable as an individual. And that's usually not the case. That might be the case in lone attackers. It's definitely not the case in group joiners. That's what research shows. The second thing we love to assume is that it must be because they have a disturbing and or traumatizing upbringing or are socioeconomically disadvantaged. There are, there are some people that join violent extremist groups that have that background profile. There are also tons of people that join violent extremist groups that do not have a disadvantaged background that we cannot blame pure socioeconomic factors. And what that means is that what's very hard for us to comprehend is that this is a rational choice model. For most people, they are joining violent extremist groups because it was the best option for them. It provides them a sense of community. It provided them a sense of empowerment. It provides them a social network to lean into and build strength from. It also tends to provide a narrative where they are encouraged to be the hero. So even though for us it's hate-based violence, their heroism and their worldview is that by countering, whether it's immigrants or countering the LGBTQIP plus community or by pushing back on the Jewish community, whatever they have targeted as the enemy, they're feeling empowered thinking that they're actually making the world a better place in providing their hate-based extremism. And that's a really sad thing because it means they weren't given other options or choices or education or other in-groups that were facilitating a non-violent and non-hate-based way of belonging. So we know that for tech companies, on the one hand, we should be taking down content that violates. But on the other hand, we have a bunch of tools and strategies. We are not necessarily the credible voice. In fact, we're definitely usually not the credible voice to push back on hate and extremism. 
And that's where civil society is so key. Uh, NGOs, CSOs, activists, your voices are 10 times more credible than a tech company telling you not to be an extremist. So our role is really to upscale and optimize your voices with the tools that we have, but lean into you being the credible voice. And so I will uh, share a couple of slides with you just to exemplify what that looks like. Um, and you should, and now as soon as I go into slide mode, I can't tell if you see all my slides or some of them. Aaron, maybe you wanna step in and tell me what you do and don't see, because as soon as I share, I can't see anything. Uh, so we can see partnerships and collaboration at the moment, yeah, so. Okay, and do you see the next slide or just the partnerships and collaboration? Just the partnerships and collaboration. Okay, so these are just a couple examples of some of the global partnerships that we have developed and continue to develop. And this is just around things like looking at dangerous organizations. So on the one side, we wanna make sure we have really adequate research to tell us what works, what sort of counter speech is adequate in pushing back on hate speech and extremism. How do we see the tactics of violent extremists shift? And then on the other side, we wanna facilitate with trainings, whether that's that could be supporting existing networks like the European Commission and the Civil Society Empowerment Program that already has an ongoing network of NGOs, or Hadaya based out of Abu Dhabi, or New America, or Dibor Acher that looks at combining voices of both Jewish and Muslim communities in Israel. So some of the harder topics out there, we wanna help give trainings to different civil society networks to optimize how they're looking at tooling online. We also want to facilitate with giving suggestions and best advice for media training of how do you create compelling content? How do you really raise, raise awareness? And then how do you measure and evaluate that? So really quickly, I'll talk through the levels that you might want to consider when you're engaging with what you call countering extremism. So on the one hand, first and foremost, you need to decide who are, is your target audience. Are you looking at making a super broad campaign where you're reaching all of society or as much of society as possible? And if you're trying to reach broad society, it's probably quite catch all content. And you're probably just trying to cause some natural resiliency to violent extremist messaging. That widest bar could be like trying to engage with young people in a given society. Or the next level in, are you trying to reach out to people that might have already come into contact with certain violent extremist messages that are perhaps indirect influencers that are starting to question some of the narrative arcs that some of these hate-based groups are already putting out there? And that's going to be a smaller group of people, and you're already defining the type of violent extremism that you might be tackling. That next level in is symp sympathizers and potential recruits. Are you trying to reach the people that are already starting to share content that might be worrisome, that are already starting to join groups that show that they have sympathies towards a violent extremist ideology? Or lastly, and the smallest group that is what we would call a low prevalence, high risk audience, are you trying to engage with people that are, would already consider themselves a member of a violent extremist group, somebody that already has a swastika tattoo that has already pledged allegiance to a group that is already a group follower? And each one of these is going to have a different metric for success. And I would say that the closer you get to that center, the more you want to ensure you have the training and capacity to reach out to what is potentially a violent and retaliatory group. And so that is on you to know what risk your own social network is willing to play in this. And most people are really in those first two broader levels, and that is a very necessary level. Very few people are down at the point where they are part of disengagement programs trying to get people to leave violent extremist networks. So the second question is, how are we approaching the creation of content? So these are three questions you should always ask yourself when creating content. What form of speech are you going to take? And I would tell you right now that online, adding photo or video to your content will make it go 60 to 80% further. So think about how you scroll through content and where you stop. Secondly, your tone of speech. Are you using humor to undermine an extremist narrative? Are you trying to have a serious tone to have a very serious dialogue with the community online? Are you trying to create a cognitive opening that is shocking or disturbing? 
in order to get somebody to realize how bad a situation is. Again, that's completely up to you in how you want to view online content. And then lastly, who's the most effective speaker? Who are you going to resonate with your target audience? It is not based on who you think you like or even personalities that might have celebrity status necessarily. Who is going to be a credible voice to the people that you've decided you want to reach? And again, peer-to-peer -peer and friend networks tend to go further than distanced networks. And so you just being part of your community might be more credible than anyone else. And then what does this start looking like? Because we talked about these different layers. And, and so I'll give three examples and then I'll open it up to questions. But these are examples that come from real world counter speech that's been targeted. And it's to highlight different ways people are approaching this. Here's an example of what I think you'd probably say you'd never heard of as a piece of counter speech that is still considered very successful. This is called Average Muhammad, and it was created by a man who's of Somali descent that was living in the US. And he realized that for young Somali second and third generation immigrants, there was not a space for them to talk about identity. There was not a space for them to talk about racism or interfaith communication. And yet this was a youth that was considered highly at risk and vulnerable at the time and continues to be, um, but that they didn't have a space to ask questions that maybe they didn't feel comfortable asking their parents about and didn't feel comfortable asking if they have religious figures in their life, probably would not approach them for this. And so it was done by making one to two minute video cartoons and aiming them at younger Somali second and third generation US and UK youth and engaging them through cartoons and allowing a space for them to ask difficult identity questions that was a safe space. So again, a very small refined target audience, but providing an outlet for causing resiliency and allowing positive dialogue within a very small and defined community. Another example of a really great online campaign that was a short, small, targeted online campaign is called Kein Grund Rassist zu werden. Um, I'm not a natural German speaker, but that roughly translates to no reason to be racist. And the whole point of this was to take meme culture and largely launch on Instagram. So you had perfectly square formatted Instagram friendly, funny little memes. And these things translate to things like, shoot, I dropped my ice cream, no reason to be racist. Oh my God, I have a bad hair day, no reason to be racist. And it kind of sounds funny, but what it was targeting, especially a couple of years ago, were micro grievances, micro racisms that were being targeted at refugee and asylum seeking communities that were influxing into Germany uh, during the refugee crisis. And a lot of local communities started blaming the refugee crisis and immigrant culture on lots of their own micro grievances, such as lack of job opportunity or busy streets or things like this. And it, so the, the meme in and of itself kind of made you laugh or think, well, that's ridiculous. And then what was shared underneath the meme led you to further information about positive things that immigrants were doing in the community, positive ways you could connect with refugees, um, showing and highlighting these different benefits that having a diverse community was bringing to Germany. So the meme and online side of it made you pause, stop and giggle, and then it led you to more strategic information to engage audiences. And then lastly, when we look at a catch all campaign, um, I think it's always helpful to highlight something that maybe you'd all heard of a few years back, uh, bring back our girls. And I highlight this one because strategically, it really shows how language matters. And if you do wanna trend more globally, some very basic tactics. So one, having very sympathetic images of local communities. Two, was definitely language. So it wasn't bring back these girls that you've never heard of from communities that you've never engaged with, from a country you've never traveled to in a city you've definitely never heard of. It was bring back our girls, the language made for a global catch-all phrase that anyone in the world could connect to. They also made sure it was in English as the catch-all global language. They also made it was hashtagable um, and they started getting female communities in higher and higher statuses to catch on to this. So this is an example of a civil society led campaign that ended up forcing more government funded action against terrorist networks on the ground 
it did result in bringing back some, although unfortunately not all of the schoolgirls that were kidnapped by Boko Haram. But the fact that many of you on this call probably have heard of it also shows how language format and campaign and visual aspects can really make an impact on getting top-down approaches shifted. So with that, I will perhaps pause there and start opening it up for questions. This is really just a, a tip of the iceberg of trying to get us inspired of how are we thinking about our audiences? How are we thinking about engaging online? Where do we think we are best placed to do that? Um, and what's the relationship between what might be your approach where you think you're best placed and then where you might wanna take some of your action and put it online. The online space is definitely not meant to replace some of your amazing offline efforts. They're meant to supplement, they're meant to reach audiences you might not otherwise reach in the offline space. And sometimes it's very strategic to use that online space to break you outside of your own echo chamber and your own social biases that you might have to reach audiences that otherwise you wouldn't be connecting with. So I'll leave it there. I know there's a 30 second delay and then Aaron is going to help uh, in our little backstage chat, feed me some of the questions to answer to. I see one question coming in about how can we measure a change of behavior in society before and after a campaign? Well, I think this is a measurement and evaluation has traditionally been very difficult in this space, but I think that the online tools provide more metrics than you'd normally be able to gain traditionally speaking. So as, a, as an academic background and a practitioner background, the results I was able to get 10 years ago compared to today, traditionally I would have had to wait months to get results back that I thought were accurate. And now online I can see results within a week or two and, and be able to see if my campaign is hitting its target audience. So I would say measuring behavior before and after is a little bit difficult unless you have an A-B testing audience. What I would say is if you want to get to impact metrics, the best thing to do is first make sure that when you have a campaign, you have a clear call to action for your audience to measure against. So if you're just putting out beautiful content and people see it and they say, okay, that's beautiful content, you don't know if that impacted them. You need to ask something of your audience to measure against. So you need to say whether that's go to this website and read more, and then you can measure click-through rates to see if people actually were interested in that, whether that's share your experience, whether that's engaging in a particular conversation, you should define an action to measure against. Otherwise, you're just kind of putting out content and hoping that people like it, but not being able to measure or not really if they like it. The other thing is if you are asking for comments or asking for engagement to do just some light touch discourse analysis on how people are engaging with your content. And the most effective material online turns passive scrolling and passive viewing into an active dialogue. So the most successful campaigns use the content online to reach somebody, to have them reach out to them, but then take that and are able to then communicate. So if you put campaigns out there, but you're not monitoring comments and you're not willing to engage in those comments, you lose out on getting that extra depth of impact and engagement on your own content. So light discourse analysis and engagement on your content is the best way to turn passive viewing into active conversation. And that is exactly what violent extremist recruitment networks do as well. They put out passive catchy content. And if they catch someone like phishing, they pull it in and they turn it into a very personal dialogue. So having a little extra time and space for that dialogue is extremely important. And I would recommend trying to get that active dialogue as much as possible on your content or taking it into a space where you can have a more active dialogue. Um, okay, I see another question that says, you run a group with 100,000 plus members. First of all, that's a huge number of people. So congratulations on that number in a group with a big impact area of social activism. Um, you mentioned that Facebook starts thinking about disinformation and misinformation, but we're not reacting when you report violations because of hate speech. Um, and you have a list of fake accounts. I will say for anyone on this call putting, um, if you have very specific questions about your own Facebook account or what you've been flagging, maybe follow up via Aaron because 
the the one thing I will say is despite all of our apps, I'm not psychic. And so I won't be able to know your exact circumstances, but if you think that you're flagging hate speech and it's being missed, that's a really good follow-up point for us, especially if there's certain hate speech terms you think that we are just not able to get to. That is something we want to know about. We're constantly updating our language prowess around what hate speech looks like in Hungarian, Romanian, French, Czech. Uh, it's constantly having to see the nuance of what hate speech looks like so that we can take better action. Um, and I would say that on misinformation and disinformation, it's a slightly different team to mine. So there's increasing policies around misinformation. We have policies around things like the removal of um, violence inciting conspiracy networks. But generally speaking, if somebody lies, that there's not a policy against lying. So if I go online and I say, you're wearing a yellow shirt and you're not, that's not what we're talking about. That wouldn't come down. But it's when we start seeing misinformation tied to xenophobic conspiracy theories, tied to these sort of, especially in the white supremacy space, these dog whistle terms that start being used. So maybe there's some, some follow-up that we can take up with Aaron and his team um, that's running Game Changer. And if you have specifics, email them and we can take it in a bundle. We do also have uh, what we call trusted partners. So if your organization is constantly, as part of your day-to-day, -day, looking at hate speech or violent extremism online, I think we should also be connected because we're constantly partnering with people to make sure that you can give a little extra context in how you flag things. Um, how was the average Muhammad concept received within the wider community? I guess it mean it depends what you mean by wider community. Within the Somali community and within ethnic minority communities and the Muslim community, it was very positively received. Um, and in fact, the man who drove the campaign was working a lot with interfaith groups and was also working a lot with imams in the community. So he wasn't just alone developing all the content. Um, and he did, it was not just with Facebook, he did a lot with Twitter and YouTube as well to reach different audiences. It was very positively and sensitively received within the Somali community and within the wider Muslim community at the time. Uh, gladly. So we have, uh, we'll, we'll make time for one more question. Um, so someone asks, uh, so great presentation. Uh, you mentioned the gray area of content on Facebook. How do you balance between hate speech and the freedom of speech on social media? So. I'll let Aaron take that and then that'll be our last question. Uh, but again, Aaron will have a session later today um, and maybe she'll address some things that, that are relevant. So by all means, take it away, Aaron. Yeah, and repeat it once more succinctly. Apologies. So the question is, how do you balance between hate speech and freedom of speech on social media is the question. Yeah, I think this is really, you're, you're asking one of the biggest dilemmas of all tech companies right now, is that really there are three pillars that we are having to draw a line in the sand around of where any one of our platforms stands. And really, this is something that every government has also had to question. And it's really the opposing forces between solving for privacy, security, and voice, or free speech. And each platform kind of has a slightly different line in the sand based on how their platform operates, who they think is on their platform, and whether or not they're erring more towards free speech or more towards security or more towards privacy. And if you solve for just one of those, it will be at the cost of the other two. I would say that Facebook is probably a little more conservative in what it takes down. So it takes down probably a little bit more content than some of the other platforms. And I think that's largely because we have such a diverse audience online. So it's, I think over 3 billion, across our apps, over 3 billion monthly users, if you look at Instagram, Facebook, Messenger, and WhatsApp. And it's a, a huge age diversity and geographic and cultural diversity. So our hate speech policy is based purely on working with human rights organizations and UN entities, whereby we need to see dehumanization, incitement, or hate targeted based on people because of protected categories. So the United Nations has a few protected categories about race, gender, uh, ethnicity, nationality. We go above and beyond some of those. So we don't just include gender, but we include sexuality and gender identity, which are slightly different. Um, we also include things like severe disability or disease. So if you are mocking or coordinating hate around somebody because of a disability or because they have HIV or another disease, um, that would also count as hate speech. 
where the gray area is probably most prominent is that we do not have a policy that says you cannot critique ideologies. And this, I think, gets at some really difficult gray area. So you can criticize and speak harshly about a religion, but not around the people of the religion. So it's about attacking people, not concepts. But I think that makes for some big gray area. Um, and we're constantly updating these policies. I think the most important thing to recognize is that when you're a tech company, you can learn and update policies perhaps more quickly compared to other sectors. And the most recent update to our policy literally just came out yesterday, and I'm very pleased it finally came about, is that we are saying now, we took down a lot of content around Holocaust denial, but didn't have a blanket policy against Holocaust denial. And we've increased that to say, that we are now banning Holocaust denial as a whole. So that's a long time coming, but it, it shows that we are constantly evolving those. So if you have more questions, uh, I'm gonna be back in a couple hours for a longer workshop and we can dive into some of the nuances of these questions as we go. Thank you, Aaron.